Hi, I'm Brad Kelly, curator of the National Civil War Museum, and this is a captivating story of the Civil War, brought to you by the National Civil War Museum and sponsored by Mr. Stephen Pahalik. The story I'm going to talk to you about today is about a sergeant. Uh, his name was Franklin Beaverstock. He was a sergeant with Company A of the 3rd West Virginia Cavalry. During the war, he was captured twice. And uh, we have an artifact here that uh, uh, he created, he carved uh, when he was a prisoner of war uh, in Richmond, Virginia. The first time he was captured was uh, while he was out on patrol around Culpeper, Virginia during the Cedar Mountain Campaign in 1862, August of 1862. Uh, initially, he was brought to Danville, Virginia after he was captured. Uh, they had uh, warehouses there that were converted into uh, prisoner of war uh, camp. And while he was there, uh, the uh, Confederates decided uh, that they were going to vaccinate the prisoners because there was a smallpox epidemic uh, kind of rampaging through the town and it had gotten into the uh, prisoner of war population as well. A lot of the uh, prisoners didn't handle the inoculation uh, very well. Uh, it started to give them boils and blisters and rashes, and eventually uh, some of them even died from the effects of that. The effects didn't seem to uh, affect Sergeant Beaverstock initially. Uh, his symptoms didn't show up until uh, well after the war, as a matter of fact. Uh, eventually, uh, he was paroled, uh, but uh, before he was uh, exchanged, he was sent to uh, Richmond to be held for a few days before uh, moving on to Aiken's Landing where the uh, prisoner exchanges happen. Uh, it's possibly there where he carved uh, this uh, piece. This is a tie slide. It basically cinches up a tie uh, so it's right tight around the neck uh, and on it it has an American Eagle and on the sides it says Libby Prison and uh, Union underneath that. Uh, so it's a, a nice little uh, carving, uh, prisoner of war carving that he did. Now, once uh, Sergeant uh, Beaverstock was uh, paroled and eventually exchanged, he was sent back to his regiment and he continued on. However, uh, in the fall of 1863, he was captured again at Griffinburg, Virginia. This time he was sent back to Richmond. Uh, he was either uh, most likely uh, to Bell Island, which was a large prisoner of war camp uh, on an island uh, in the James River just off of uh, uh, the city of Richmond. Um, he was there for a few months and he was eventually transferred to the newly built uh, prisoner of war camp in uh, Andersonville, Georgia the infamous uh, Camp uh, Sumter, uh, Andersonville. It's known as Andersonville uh, than its regular name of, of Camp Sumter. Uh, so he was sent there uh, in March of 1864. By June of 1864, he'd become fairly weak uh, and he was sent to the hospital. Uh, he had uh, diarrhea, uh, which was really uh, uh, causing him, him to become very dehydrated. Uh, the hospital at Andersonville had a reputation of uh, once you were sent there, uh, a lot of times you never came back. Uh, fortunately for Sergeant uh, Beaverstock, uh, he did survive that experience and was sent back into the stockade. Um, in the fall of 1864, uh, after Atlanta had been captured, General Sherman started his march to the sea the uh, general in charge of the Southern uh, prisoner of war camps uh, decided that they were going to transfer uh, a large portion of the prisoners at Andersonville to Savannah, Georgia, so that they wouldn't be um, uh, repatriated by General Sherman. They didn't want to give up their, their prisoners of war. So they sent a, a large group of them to Savannah and Sergeant Beaverstock was part of that group. When they reached Savannah, they were told that they would be 
uh, they were going to be exchanged. So they were very happy. They were very upbeat at that point. But as the days wore on, the days turned into weeks, into, into months, and they started to realize that they were probably just told that story just to keep them calm. Uh, the camp in Savannah um, didn't have a stockade like at Andersonville. So the chances to uh, escape were a lot better, at least initial escapes. A lot of men who did escape uh, were later recaptured because they were, uh, you know, Savannah is surrounded by swamps. They really didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, so they were generally recaptured. Um, there was one lieutenant, uh, his name was Lieutenant Davis, who was a, uh, in charge of the prison guard. And he was uh, a very cruel individual. He mistreated the prisoners. Uh, he took delight in having men who were trying to escape, having them shot and, and you know, uh, basically celebrating the fact. So he was a, a pretty wicked guy that the prisoners really, really didn't like. Well, anyways, back to Sergeant Beverstock. Uh, when he uh, was at Andersonville, he started putting together uh, a suit of clothes. Uh, his uh, uh, Union uniform was pretty wore out, and so he started replacing parts of it. And he replaced things uh, like he, he had found a sutler's jacket uh, from uh, somebody who had been a uh, sutler with one of the Union regiments who had died at Andersonville, and he took that. And then he had a uh, hat fashioned uh, to look like a uh, Confederate uh, civilian style hat. Uh, and then he uh, found scraps of uh, fabric and he actually made, he sewed together a pair of pantaloons that were of the Southern style. So before too long, he started to look like a Southern citizen. Well, when he got to Savannah, uh, there was uh, one day where a new group of prisoners was coming in and the citizens of Savannah started gathering around in large groups. And he uh, put on his, his new suit. Uh, he looked uh, basically just like a Southerner, uh, kind of a, a ragged Southerner, but a Southerner nonetheless. And as he began to uh, walk towards the front of the uh, Union prisoners, uh, and he kind of uh, was walking around, kind of looking around, almost like a, like a tourist or something, one of the prison guards said to him, hey, don't get too close to those Yankee prisoners. And he, without skipping a beat, just kind of nodded in agreement and stepped back into the crowd of, uh, of Southerners that were there to look at the Union prisoners. And he stood there for a while until he felt that he had uh, put on a good enough show that he was done looking at the Yankees. And he slowly turned around and walked right out the gate. <laughs> so he, uh, he played that pretty cool. Uh, now he had to decide how he was going to make his escape. How was he going to get out of Savannah? Well, what he did was he went to the train yard and he found an engine that was headed towards Macon, Georgia, okay, towards where uh, General Sherman's troops were in that direction, that general direction. And he uh, went to the very front of the train to the engine and the engineer was getting ready to go and he said, uh, excuse me, sir, but I'm from Griswoldville. I work in the shops there and I don't have any money on me, uh, but I'm, you know, I could uh, give you my services. I could be uh, your assistant. I'm familiar with the workings of, of a, a train and I can uh, be of any service to you if you would, would give me a ride on the train. And the engineer was like, sure, that sounds like a good deal. You're a nice uh, Southern kid. Uh, Sergeant Beaverstock had a, a very young looking face. Uh, so he was, uh, he, people tended to trust what he said uh, and he took full advantage of that. Um, and so he said, okay, come on aboard and, and we'll, we'll put you to work. And he, uh, did as much as he could for the engineer and his assistant. He kept busy the entire time uh, and they were thrilled with his service. Uh, they, you know, shared their food with him. 
uh, when they stopped for the night, they even shared their bed with him. Uh, you know, he, and he was concerned too because he knew that he had uh, lice in his clothing you, because all prisoners of war did, all soldiers did. I mean, that was just a fact of life. And he didn't want to uh, transfer any of those uh, little uh, lice passengers <laughs> over to the engineer and his assistant, but they were, they were very uh, adamant about him uh, sharing uh, their accommodations. And so he finally relented and luckily nothing uh, came of that in the, in the next day or two. Uh, but one of the things he was worried about is as uh, they would stop at different stations along the way, other uh, prisoner trains would be going by and they would be transferring prisoners. So prisoners would be walking by uh, the locomotive that he was on and he was worried that somebody would recognize him and uh, you know call out his name and say hey what are you doing up there and then that would be it that he would be you know uncovered and uh, so he basically every time uh, any prisoners uh, were marched past he would turn his back and keep busy on the other side of the cab and luckily for him uh, nothing happened nobody recognized him uh, and they were were on their way again as they approached uh, um, Griswoldville, Georgia. Uh, there was he saw a uh, a big house in the distance, a big white house, and he pointed out to the uh, the engineer. He said, "Oh, that big house over there. That's where my uncle lives. And I'd like to stop and pay him a visit, and maybe get some fresh clothes, and then I'll just walk into town and uh, and see my father." And uh, so he. Uh, uh, Pulled the, pulled the wool over the eyes of the engineer again. They actually stopped the train so he could hop off and they called after him and he said, if you're ever you know, in Savannah again, look me up. And you know, they thought he was the greatest thing because he was a hard worker, uh, loyal Southerner, they thought. Um, and so he waved goodbye and he uh, started walking towards that white house. And uh, when he was sure that the train had gone and he wasn't being watched anymore, uh, he ducked into a cornfield and then he found a thicket where he bedded down and stayed there uh, for the rest of that day. And then uh, when night uh, uh, came around, he uh, started walking north to where he uh, kind of pictured uh, General Sherman's army to be. And he did this for several days and he was making great progress. Um, but he was also getting kind of cocky, you know, he thought, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I'm, you know, I'm making all sorts of good time. I'm getting closer to our lines. I can just feel it, you know, and, uh, eventually, you know, what he would do is he'd go through a cornfield and then as the cornfield stopped, if there was a road, he would approach it slowly and look around and make sure there was nobody there. And then he would dash across, to, you know, to the woods or to another cornfield or wherever he was, uh, heading in that direction. And, uh, but after a few days of this, he got kind of lazy and uh, he uh, was coming through a, a cornfield and instead of slowing down and stopping at where the road crossed between the, the cornfields, uh, he jumped over the fence and right out into the middle of the road when he heard somebody yell, halt, uh, stay where you are. And he turned around and there was a cavalry detachment right there just happened to be passing by at that moment. He didn't hear their hoofs of the horses because of the roads were so dusty. Uh, they muffled the sound, so he didn't realize they were there. And just like that, uh, he was caught, but they didn't yet know who he was. He told them the same story he had told the engineer that he was from Griswoldville, uh, that he was, you know, had been uh, on a furlough to, uh, from the shops uh, to uh, visit some relatives but they were all from that area and they began quizzing him. And before too long, they caught him in the, in the lie. And so they were assumed he was a spy and they were going to you know, have him hanged. And so he started to get pretty nervous. He realized that they weren't messing around. Uh, he could see them you know, basically uh, picking out a tree to hang him from. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, wasn't going to have that obviously he had so he had no choice at that point but to come clean and tell them he was an escaped prisoner 
and he told them the story about being transferred to Savannah and eventually uh, with his suit of clothes uh, getting on the train and fooling the conductor and making it this far. Well, it turns out that he was only 20 miles from the Union lines, from General Sherman's army. And those patrols were out there because after the fall of Atlanta, there were a lot of Confederate deserters in the area, a lot of uh, stragglers, and they were out looking for Confederates uh, who had uh, left the ranks, uh, deserters and that type of thing. And that's when they caught him. Um, so they sent him back to Savannah. So he was back to square one. As soon as he got there, uh, the much hated Lieutenant Davis uh, walked up to him and he said, well, we're not gonna have any more of that. And he took the tails of his coat and he ripped it all the way up to the collar and took it from him and you know pushed him back into the, into the pen, basically. Uh, so that was it as far as him trying to escape. Uh, but within three weeks, a, um, an exchange had been uh, agreed to for, I think it was upwards of uh, 10,000 men. And he somehow managed to get his name on the list. And so before too long, he was uh, paroled and sent to Maryland, to Annapolis at Camp Parole. And then eventually after a furlough home, he rejoined his uh, regiment and uh, finished out the war that way. Now there's a, a interesting story that it, it's really uh, just a, one of the amazing things that happened uh, in the Civil War just by pure chance. As he was uh, going home on his furlough, going to Ohio, he saw on the very train he was on, Lieutenant Davis wearing a civilian suit. And he walked up to him and he said, you're Lieutenant Davis. And he said, uh, Lieutenant Davis said in his Southern accent, which I can't really do, but he said, no, sir, I'm, uh, you're mistaken. And uh, he was very forceful about it. And he says, no, I'm not mistaken. I know exactly who you are. And uh, luckily there uh, just happened to be a detachment, to have been a detachment of Union soldiers on the train. He alerted them that he was a Confederate, uh, probably up to no good, uh, that he, and he told them who he was. Uh, he was basically taken to Camp Chase in Ohio, and uh, some of the uh, soldiers there who were former prisoners uh, verified who he was. They knew who he was because he was so hated. Um, they had been prisoners at, at uh, Savannah as well. And so he was uh, searched, and documents on him uh, were found that showed that he was on his way to Canada uh, with dispatches for uh, Confederate raiders who were making forays into the United States and causing all sorts of, of mischief. So he was uh, uh, sent to uh, Fort uh, Johnson, I'm sorry, Johnson's Island, uh, Ohio, and he was uh, sentenced to death. Uh, while he was there, uh, it became known that he was a prisoner there, sentenced to death, and, but he had family connections and they had arranged with uh, uh, some of the uh, Southern Unionists uh, in Baltimore uh, to uh, make a deal that would spare his life. And he found out about this through the chaplain. So he, you know, nobody else knew that he was gonna be spared, but he did. And so he was bragging about it and, you know, spouting off at the mouth saying, oh, well, I'm gonna be executed. I, might as well have a bath, so at least there will be one clean corpse on this island. You know, being, you know, his usual uh, bragging self, very, very annoying and everything. Uh, but at one point he kind of slipped and let it be known that he knew in advance. <laughs> so everybody knew that he wasn't actually that brave. He already knew he was going to be spared. And so he was eventually sent to uh, Fort Delaware, where within a few short months, uh, he uh, died of disease. So uh, that was the end of uh, Lieutenant Davis. Um, Sergeant uh, Beaverstock uh, served out the rest of the war, uh, went home to Ohio, eventually got into banking. However, uh, by the uh, mid 1870s, uh, the uh, inoculation that he had received at Danville, Virginia in 1862 had caught up with him. 
uh, it started to appear as a, a rash on his uh, right temple. Um, and it, it uh, eventually the skin became so uh, rough and um, like boils, that type of thing. The skin eventually just sloughed off uh, and it left a scar, a really uh, hideous scar that left him basically deformed. Uh, it was really uh, just terrible. And uh, from then on, he was really just not his same old self. Uh, he was usually had a really vigorous constitution. He should have lived a long, long life. Uh, but by 1878, uh, that um, Confederate vaccination had taken its toll and he passed away in Toledo, Ohio. And uh, that was pretty much the end of uh, uh, Sergeant Beaverstock. Uh, but uh, he does leave behind a really fantastic story, uh, a great uh, escape attempt, and uh, a nice little trinket here uh, that he had carved while he was a prisoner of war. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed this uh, captivating story of the Civil War, and I hope to see you at the museum. Thanks very much.